Okay, so we are fortunate to have Mike DeWeese uh, with us here today to deliver the second in the Fenrir Distinguished Data Scientist Speaker Series. Um, Mike's a professor of physics and neuroscience at the University of California, Berkeley. His theoretical interests include non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, information theory, and machine learning. Um, and he has also done actual experimental neuroscience work as well as neuroscience theory. And today's talk, I guess, is a bit machine learning and a bit neuroscience theory. So, Mike, why don't you uh, take it away from there? All right. Thanks, Steve. Fun to talk here. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and that's right. Uh, what I'm going to focus on today is going to be, uh, as, as the title might suggest, something that involves machine learning and also involves uh, neuroscience, systems neuroscience, how the brain works. Um, but we also are interested in, in uh, um, non-equilibrium stat max. So I made this uh, very high level fancy graphic to sort of make this point. You know, we're interested in the brain. We're interested in neural networks. Or here's artificial neural networks down here. We're also interested in non-equilibrium stat max. It turns out that I think most people are aware of the fact that there's, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, a revolution going on with uh, artificial neural networks right now. There's also a quiet revolution going on with non-equilibrium stat max. So uh, there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff that's been happening in the last 20 years, I'd say. Um, uh, and it's actually gone largely um, sort of under the radar, I think, in American physics department. So that's been something that we've been very excited to work on. And how does it relate to the brain? So I have arrows between every pair of things here. Why is that? Well, I think it's obvious between the brain and artificial neural networks, these were inspired, right, by the brain. Turns out we can learn about the brain. I'll talk about that today. We can learn about the brain by studying um, artificial neural networks um, of the right type, I would say. Some of them are more accurate for describing the brain, some are less. I'll have more to say about that. For non-equilibrium stat mech, it turns out that approach to equilibrium, which is what happens if you drive a system, some thermodynamic system out of equilibrium, right? by pushing it really hard. Uh, that's actually, uh, in some ways, uh, the mathematics involved in how you, how you describe that return to equilibrium looks a lot like learning. Um, and so there are uh, some mathematical tools we use from non-equilibrium stat mech to understand learning in the brain and learning also in artificial neural networks. And, um, so I just wanted to point that out. So it's a big part of our group, but uh, today, like I said, I'll focus on the section up here just to keep it under 45 minutes. Um, so here's my outline. I'm gonna talk about, um, um, it's, well, actually, here's another way to think about uh, how physics can inform us when it comes to artificial neural networks in the brain. I'm gonna sort of talk about a, a quote unquote principled way, I will say, about thinking about how to do, develop theories for how the brain works, um, as opposed to you know, sort of the pejorative, uh, this is a pejorative statement, but you know, one way you might think about studying biology or even neural net, artificial neural nets is, a sort of like a stamp collecting approach. There's all these facts and details to collect all this information. It's hard to organize, um, but maybe if you know enough things and you put it together, you can figure out what's going on or at least model it at some level. But you know, our hope is that we can come up with a few basic ideas, sort of physics style, you know, that will allow us through some optimization principle or some something, some sort of variational principle that will tell us a lot of what's going on. Um, and that's especially helpful when you got models with gazillions of parameters. Or you're trying to understand something as complicated as the brain. You know, and the brain is pretty impolite, right? Not only do you have, you know, enormous numbers of part of parts of it, but these aren't electrons where everyone's exactly the same, right? Each neuron's a little different in some way. So you have to come up with some, I would say, it's really helpful to come up with some principle to guide your, your theory, right? Um, anyway, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then I will talk about, okay, if we, if we uh, develop some, um, if we develop some algorithm that seems to predict the way Oh, oh, what does V1 RFs mean? V1 is the primary visual cortex, part of your uh, brain that, that process, that the first part that processes visual information in the cerebral cortex, and RFs is receptive fields. So these are the, these are the visual features in the world that neurons care about, that they respond to, right? So can this algorithm work in real brains? And I'm gonna argue that it could, and then, and then as a result, we can make predictions. Um, and in fact, there's been there's been a lot of really great work over the and in fact Steve Strong and I sat together uh, in a talk in 1996 when I first met Bernal and I think Steve first met Bernal Olshaus and he did some really seminal work in this area I'll talk about in a, in a couple slides um, just as coincidentally I just remembered um, and most of the work that's been done over the past couple of decades has been about receptive field shapes what what are the 
features in the, in the visual world that cells care about in our brain, right? And why they respond to them. But I'd like to go beyond that and ask questions about the connectivity structure in the brain or the activity patterns you see, make predictions beyond just what features matter. Um, and then I'll talk about whitening. And by that, I mean, well, I'll, I'll describe the, the operation, but if you're familiar with it, I'm just talking about essentially doing uh, principal component analysis or sphering the data. It's, it's traditional before you send in some uh, visual input or any kind of input for that matter into some kind of a sparse coding model. First thing you do is you whiten your data, you sort of set it up so that the variance of the data in all directions is the same. Uh, and that has some, uh, some benefits, but it turns out it has a lot of benefits for a biologically plausible network. So I'm gonna make an argument at the end that uh, I've got a new idea for why, or my group does, for why our retinas do the pre-processing they do before you get to the cortex, um, which I'm excited about. Uh, in part because one argument against the ideas I'm going to present, the naysayers about uh, when it comes to sparse coding might say, well, if sparse coding is such a great idea, why is it taking until you get to your cortex before you start doing it? Why don't you do it in your retina? Um, why, why does your retina do all this other stuff first? And there's a couple different answers to that question that sound plausible, but here's a new answer people didn't know about before. So it's another way to think about processing um, and why whitening might be a good idea. Uh, and I'll mention some ongoing projects that uh, come from this story, uh, and I'll give acknowledgments. All right, so principle of sparse coding. What am I talking about? So uh, the real world is structured. You heard it here first. You know, you look out your window, uh, there's mountains and there's uh, whatever. This, well, some windows. If you have a home by the beach, this is what you get to see out the window. You don't see this out. Well, I guess in Chicago, you could see this out the window, but typically you don't see uh, unstructured stuff. And when I say it's structured, I mean, I think we have an intuitive idea of what's going on over here, but mathematically, how do we describe the structure here? Um, and, and why do we care? The reason I care is that, well, the fact that visual input and other types of natural sensory input is so structured, might be that our brain is, has evolved over time to do a good job of efficiently encoding this, right? Um, so before I get into efficiency, let me just list, uh, just give you a laundry list of different ideas of uh, sort of principles sort of like, like physics principles we might apply to understanding how, how the brain works. One is maximum information. Um, you know, the visual system, in fact, there is a, an information bottleneck. You go from a, a hundred million uh, photoreceptors roughly in your two eyes, and then you go through a bunch of processing and it goes to your optic nerve, right? The, 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 the information lines that go to your, up to your brain. And there's only about a million of those. So you have a hundred fold reduction in terms of numbers of cells anyway, um, so maybe you want to maximize the information through that bottleneck, right? It might be a really good idea. Turns out that is a good idea. There's, that explains a lot about um, various kinds of coding and in, 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 in different sensory systems in biology. How about reliable information? That's another kind of principle you might apply to, to come up with a good theory. Like in your motor periphery, controlling your hand, you don't necessarily want to send a lot of information in your hand. You just want to make sure that the information you send is understood properly and the hand works properly, right? So Reliable information is a good idea for a principle in some parts of the nervous system. Maximum entropy. In fact, we even studied minimum entropy in some cases, which no one ever had done before. Um, maximum entropy has a, obviously is a very powerful idea in physics. It turns out it's also a very powerful idea in neuroscience. There's a lot of, um, there's a cottage industry actually in using maximum entropy models to, to fit with, with you know, parameter free. Once you maximize the entropy, your, your parameters are all determined for your model. Uh, and you can go and compare against the actual activity that's recorded in the brain. And, uh, and, there, and there's a lot of success there. Minimum wiring length, uh, the idea that uh, one thing that limits um, the size of our brains is, is uh, how, just how the size of our heads. In fact, getting to the birth canal, we're limited by like the reason humans are born so, uh, so immature compared to many other animals. It has to do with how big the brain has to get uh, for an adult uh, human to function properly. So um, minimizing the wiring length by laying out your your, your circuit in a smart way actually can save you a lot of volume. Uh, and it might be an important, an important aspect of how the brain's set up. Slowness. Turns out that if I want to, if I want to look at a really complicated set of data, like a bunch of in, uh, responses in my, my retinal um, uh, neurons, right? It might be that slowness could tip me off as to where the important signals are. Uh, in other words, as I look around the room, the retinal image is changing like crazy, right? Because the entire scene changes as I look around the room, even though the objects in the room aren't going anywhere, their, their identities are remaining the same for the most part, except for very slowly varying things like 
maybe a friend of mine walks in the room and then walks out. So slowness um, done mathematically and, and with some creativity can actually be a really useful principle for figuring out coding schemes in the brain to extract useful signals out of uh, quickly varying uh, inputs. Efficiency, there's all kinds of efficiency. Obviously efficiency is a good idea. Um, and in fact, we're gonna focus on sparseness and independence, which are related to efficiency in this talk. That's a sparseness, which I'll define a little bit more in a second, is a type of efficiency, if you like. And there's more than that, but that's just to give you a, a sort of a laundry list of things I, I've thought about and that there's a lot of good ideas there. So, uh, so sparseness seems like a good candidate. What do I mean? It means minimal neural activity. And there's lots of ways to, to describe that. Um, uh, I won't, without saying them all, you could talk about um, whether you have, you have population sparseness, meaning you only have a few neurons that are active out of the population, you have lifetime sparseness, meaning that for any given neuron, it's not very active over time, right? And these are related, but not exactly the same. Uh, and there's different kinds of sparseness too, in terms of how you measure activity. Do you mean that you have strictly zero activity for most of your neurons, which would be L0 sparseness, or do you mean that, the, that if you summed up the absolute value of the activity of all your neurons, it's small, which is like L1 sparseness. So there's different kinds of sparseness. It'll turn out that, uh, it'll turn out that um, uh, it's not gonna matter too much for this talk, which one we're talking about, but I just wanted to throw that out. Um, uh, identifies, oh yes, so, so the idea of sparseness actually will automatically in a natural way give us some idea about the causes underlying um, what produces a, a visual scene, um, which is actually useful biologically, right? And in general, it's probably a useful thing to be able to do, um, not just because it produces an efficient representation, but because it, uh, it gives you uh, something meaningful about what the, what you're, what's being conveyed in the scene. Yeah, and, and uh, sparseness is efficient. Uh, if you only have a few active neurons, obviously you're gonna use less energy, right? Because those neurons are the ones that are active as opposed to everybody being active all the time. Um, and, uh, and it's also um, related to independence. If you uh, want to get as much information as possible from each of your very few active neurons, the more independent they are, sort of based on some simple ideas from information theory, the more information you can hope to get by looking at more of them. Right? If you have very redundant information in a bunch of neurons, you're gonna have to look at a lot more of them before you get the same amount of information. So if you have just a few active neurons, it might make sense to make them as independent as possible in terms of what they're conveying. Uh, it's related to overcompleteness. So a lot of us, I think, learn about um, um, various representations in, in our math and physics and engineering courses, you know, Fourier analysis, probably the best known example, right? That's an example of a complete basis, the way it's usually set up, meaning that you have a unique solution. There's a unique set of coefficients you'll put in front of each of your sine wave basis functions to represent any given signal or image or whatever you're trying to represent, right? Um, but the brain actually has way more neurons than you would need for, of a, for a complete representation. And that's partly because different parts of our brain are, are, there's duplication in a sense or higher order processing where you have the same thing represented in many places, but even within one given area, like V1, the primary visual cortex, you have way more neurons, hundreds, thousands more neurons within even a single layer of that cortical area to represent the visual input. Why is that? Well, maybe because you're trying to form a sparse representation with only a few active neurons. So you have lots of special specialized neurons that could represent particular features that may or may not be present in the scene. And the more different over complete neurons you've got, the better job you can do at being sparse and doing a really good job of representing the input without much error, right? So that's related uh, to sparseness over completenesses. Um, you get simpler population codes. So if you have a, if you have a, uh, a representation that's not highly distributed, that's, that's um, just has a few active, it, it, well, it's distributed in that it involves a population, but it's, but it's not involving lots and lots of coactive neurons. It's a lot quicker to figure out what's going on and, and decode it for downstream uh, neurons. Um, uh, and, uh, and it works. Uh, that's the best reason that I'm bothering with this. That, and what do I mean by it works for vision? Uh, what I really mean is that it's been known now since mid nineties that it does a good job, these sort of theories, these sparse coding models for predicting the, the features that cells care about. And I'll talk about other predictions that we made beyond that in a few slides. Okay, so we're back to our picture now of the beach um, and you know what features matter. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of structure here compared just to white noise instantiations. Um, uh, there, you know, when we look at this, if I'm to describe this to you, I'd say, well, there's, there's objects in the scene, there's a mountain and 
and I can just say which, which way the lighting's coming from, which is kind of tough here because it's a little bit of a hazy day. There's perspective, maybe uh, I can describe what's in, in the picture, but at a low level, so that's a high level, right? At a low level, if I want to capture as much information as I can about the scene with as little activity in my neurons, or if you like, as little time as possible, maybe, maybe I ask a, uh, a cartoonist, say, hey, you know, you got 30 seconds to make, an, to make a drawing of this image. What is she gonna do? Well, she's gonna, she's gonna look at edges. She's gonna make a line drawing that goes around the edge of all the objects because that's the most informative thing you can do in a hurry with just a few uh, active places on the page. If you think of the pencil on the paper, that pencil lead on the paper as like active neurons with a sheet of neurons that are being active, right? You'd say, oh yeah, you'd make a line drawing. Um, and then beyond that, well, you know, I, I just mentioned the idea of, of you start off with the really salient edges. Here's a really dark and light area with a hard edge between them. That's an obvious thing to draw to convey a lot of information of what's in the scene. But then there's a lot of subtle edges too. And then there's a question of, well, which are the most efficient or useful from a mathematical sense if we're gonna really do a careful job of this, right? Um, and so to get at that, what uh, look here, here again, so what I've done is I've got a black and white image now. This is all going to be about black and white images in this talk, although it doesn't really matter. But for the actual data that we we used, it was black and white, and it was whitened as well. And I'm not showing you a whitened example. I'll do that later. I'll get back to that whitening issue. But okay, so we have our our grayscale image here. We'd like to represent this little patch uh, with some with some part of my visual system. How do I do it? Well, I'm going to represent it as a linear sum of features. And these features you can think of as transparencies. I, you're probably all too young to know what I mean by that, but these are pieces of acetate with dark, uh, with dark ink, uh, you know, uh, uh, printed on them, and it's otherwise transparent. So that um, if you stack these things on top of each other, you get a linear summation, right, of these different grayscale patterns. That will, if you do a good job of multiplying them by the right coefficient. So with a certain coefficient, I turn up and down the darkness of my dark spots, right. With, with, with each of these numbers. And, you, and these coefficients you can think of as the activity of neurons. So here I've drawn, here's a neuron whose voltage, uh, so these are neurons in my brain, right, in my visual cortex. Here's a, a couple, actually this isn't data from my brain, but it's, a, it's cartoon data. And here's a couple spikes that are occurring. It turns out neurons in the brain, uh, they don't talk to each other with graded signals with some exceptions, but by and large, that's true. They talk to each other with these all or none events called, I'm gonna call spikes or action potentials. And in this case, A1 might be the number two, because I count two spikes that occurred after this image was presented to my retina. And then this guy doesn't fire at all. This guy didn't fire at all. These are just some sub-threshold, you know, uh, voltage fluctuations that don't count as activity because it can't, because these don't reach other neurons in the network. Um, and so A2 would be zero, A3 would be zero, but A1 would be non-zero. So you can see if you add this up for all the neurons in my, in my dictionary or my population of neurons, different way of saying the same things, uh, same thing, um, then you'd wind up with a, a representation of this input. Uh, and in fact, what Bruno Holzhausen figured out uh, with David Field, uh, his collaborator and advisor back in those days in the mid 90s, was that if you write down a cost function that consists of the RMS error between the input, this green X here represents the actual pixel values in this little square, and, the, uh, um, and then here's your representation, the sum over all your neurons, M indexes your neurons, right? Of your coefficients times your basis functions, these these guys, right? You take the you know RMS error of that. I guess it isn't even root mean square; it's just squared error. Pardon me. Anyway, take your error and then add to it a cost. There's another cost function, uh, a penalty in your cost function that is the that is the L1 sparseness. That is just the sum of the uh, of across all your neurons of how active each neuron is with an absolute value. So. Um, so this mathematical formulation is an unconstrained optimization. You, and then you iterate, you, you go back and forth between de deciding what values you want for the coefficients at, with fixed, um, with fixed uh, um, features, right? And then you minimize that. And, and, then, uh, and then you use that information to you take those coefficients and say, well, how could I have improved my representation by minimizing my cost function a little bit by then changing the shape of my features to do a better job. And if you iterate back and forth, eventually this thing, the sparse coding algorithm will converge and you'll have a, a dictionary of things that you say your neurons ought to represent, what features in the world they represent in order to do a good job of minimizing this cost function.
right? With this sort of a scheme of a coding scheme. Uh, right, oh yes, this is what I just said. Reconstruction error is captured by this term, activity by this term. There's not a huge amount of math in this talk. There's a couple of slides. This is one of my math slides. Okay, so uh, so this leads to representation of the data in terms of sparse activities, right? Only a, only a few, why? Because of this guy, right? You only get a few, on average, you only get a few active neurons at a time. This is unconstrained optimization. Just hit that point again. Okay, so here is what Olshausen and Field found out in 1996. Turns out that each of these little squares is one of the features that one neuron cares about in their network. And what you see is they have edge-like properties. You tend to get things that are active, like they're gray, which means they don't really care about most parts of the visual uh, patch that they're trying to represent. But they care a lot about an edge in a certain location. And these edges have, uh, they go through one, two, three, or more uh, light or dark, which means large or small um, fluctuations away from that sort of zero gray background. These are Gabor patches. They look like sine waves that are windowed by, um, often long and thin, but, but windowed by um, some sort of a Gaussian function. Anyway, they're edge detectors. So this is mathematically the kind of edge detector that the algorithm says is what you want to do if you want to do a good job. These things are local, they're oriented, they have different angles, right? They're band pass, they tend to, they're not perfectly sharp and they're not, they don't cover the entire scene. They're, they're, they're edge detectors, that's what they are. Um, and if you look instead of a, if you look at data from actual uh, mammals like a macaque monkey um, taken by Dario Ringach some time ago, turns out that, you know, it's pretty good. This is, these are the features um, that neurons in the visual cortex of that, of, of a monkey tend to care about, you know, what they individually encode under, if you assume that the model that's being used is similar to the one that I just presented, uh, and you get a lot of things that look just like what they find in the model. That was a huge theoretical triumph that Bruno and, and started a whole line of research when they said, wow, we can predict what, what biology is doing just based on a principle and taking photographs at, uh, not actually, it was actually his advisor's vacation, but take a bunch of photographs from a vacation, chop it up into little uh, segments and then train the model on that with the right principle of sparseness and with uh, a cost function of minimizing your error, right? And uh, out of it just pops this biological result. Now, it turns out there are some deviations here. You get point-like things instead of just edge things entirely. Um, and uh, it turns out that that could be accounted for by, uh, you get a little bit of a win by looking at L0 instead of L1 norm minimization. So minimizing the number of non-zero coefficients A rather than the absolute the sum of the absolute value. But the real difference is looking at over complete rather than a complete representation. That was a bigger, a bigger win. Uh, and then you, uh, here, so here's a more recent effort by, uh, again, so Bruno Olshausen's a colleague of mine at Berkeley. So is Fritz Sommer, it turns out. There's a lot of sparse coding going on um, within our uh, theoretical uh, neuroscience group at, at Berkeley. But, um, but yeah, uh, Martin Wren, Fritz Sommer, and, Br and Bruno also has an algorithm akin to this that's more sophisticated, that can handle L0 instead of L1 minimization, and that can handle um, other things too, I'll talk about in a little bit. And the upshot is that you wind up with a much better fit to the data. So great, uh, looks like sparse coding tells us something about what's going on and the visual system is using that as well to understand the structure of natural scenes. Um, can this work in real brains? Well, so here's again that picture I showed you a minute ago. And here's my representation of this scene. So, so Neuroscientists are the only, it's the only culture in the history of the human race, I think, that actually uses backward arrowheads to indicate um, flow of information from here to here. It's because the shape of, the, of the, uh, the structures on the synapse between pairs of neurons has that shape. But anyway, so these are meant to be arrowheads going in the other direction from left to right, as we see it on the screen. And what's going on is, here's my visual patch. I'm just making a, I'm just taking a, a sort of a binarized, simplified version of it. Um, and I'm saying, okay, what, how, how does my network set up here? I've got feed forward connections in blue that go from, the, from a pixel in the image to a given neuron. There's more than one neuron in my, in my world here, but I'm just gonna show one to start off with. And one way I can represent these connection strengths is the way I did a minute ago with these, with these, gray, these grayscale images that show the, the feature, the visual feature in the world that this neuron cares about. And you can think of this as the projection field, if you like often, or the receptive field. Turns out those are the same thing under some conditions that are satisfied in the networks I'm gonna talk about. So let's just call it, we can call it whatever you want, we can call it a feature, a visual feature, a receptive field or a projection field. But essentially, where does it come from? It's determined by the strengths of these connections that say, yeah, 
if you have white, uh, you know, light spot up in this pixel, I'm going to give a lot of activity to this neuron. You know, if it's dark down here, I'm going to give a lot of activity because, well, it depends on the shape of the receptor. Given this receptor field shape, yeah, if it's dark down here, then it's going to make this neuron more active. Whereas if it's light down here, it's going to make it less active, right? So this is the feature that drives this neuron to be active. And things that look different than that um, push it the other way, make it less active. And you have a bunch of neurons in your network, and they some of them are very similar for the things they code. Why? Because it's an overcomplete representation. You've got lots of similar receptive fields, lots of similar shapes for your features, right? And so, uh, and so I have a little red. So here again is an arrow, this time with a circle on the end, another weird uh, no, a nomenclature from neuroscience. This is an arrow that goes from this neuron one to neuron two. And it, the fact that I colored it red and put a circle on the end instead of a triangle reminds me to say that it's inhibitory. These guys look very similar. So if this neuron shuts this neuron down directly through a synaptic connection, based on how similar their current features are, that's a way that the network can use a local rule during, at least during inference. What's inference? That's when you determine the values of your coefficients, as opposed to learning. That's when you determine the shapes of your receptive field. So it's anyway, more, more jargon. But the point, the point is that when you're trying to figure out how active each neuron should be in representing the scene, one way to do it that is local and uh, is to have these, have these inhibitory connections. And this is a small, there's a weaker connection from neuron one to neuron three. Why? Because there's less overlap, there's less similarity in the features they represent. So they don't need to really inhibit each other that much. They're gonna be responding to different sim images anyway and represent or, or different parts of the image and they're not gonna interfere with each other. So there are algorithms that take advantage of this local idea that could be implemented in real brains, right? Um, and, and that's, uh, and, and LCA, SSC, this is uh, algorithms by Bruno and by Fritz, uh, Bruno also has an in Fritz Summer. And so that idea was already out there before we got in, in the game. Um, but the thing that didn't exist was a way to, uh, was a way to learn these shapes in the first place that's actually implemented in real, could be implemented in real brains. In other words, once you've got these features figured out, people found ways of that real brains could, using local rules, um, figure out what the activities ought to be to represent the scene in front of the eyes, right? But what didn't exist was how do you figure out what these blue connections ought to be in the first place? How do you determine what these receptive field shapes should be, right? Um, and what's more, once you know what they are and you want to go ahead and use these inhibitory connections that are strong for similarly um, configured, sim you know, similarly looking features and not so strong for non-similar, that requires non-local information, right? To figure out how strong this connection ought to be right here, this synapse right here would have to know the, all, the all the connection strengths to this neuron from the input and all the connection strengths from the input to this, you know, and that's fine if you're doing, if you're simulating networks on a, on a computer, but it's not fine if you're building a robot or if you're trying to use your real brains, your biological system to try to solve a problem. In other words, we're trying to solve a global problem. You have a global objective as far as coding. Minimize the error between your representation of the whole scene, right? And uh, do so with as few active neurons simultaneously as possible. Well, that requires a lot of non-local information to do, but yet biology is constrained and real hardware is constrained to use only local rules. So how do you do that? How do you learn these things? So that's what I'm going to talk about next. That's that's that was our contribution with this stuff. So uh, here's a couple of pictures um, of actually of sailboats of work primarily of Joel Zilberberg, a past student in the group, is now professor uh, 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 up in up at York University actually in uh, in Canada. But he so he uh, he likes to sail, uh, and so he used photographs of sailboats. He he was not into equestrian sports, otherwise it would have been saddle net, because in fact. Uh, it's he that stands for sparse and independent learning, which is a pretty good moniker, but really, strictly speaking, it's really sparse and decorrelated learning because it's only pairwise independence that he's that he's imposing with his network. Um, uh, but he doesn't like horses as much as he likes boats, so he was so that's that's, that's how that works. Anyway, branding I know you guys in the corporate world, you know all about that. Um, okay, so. Uh, so here's my here's my net, here's Joel's network. Here's another mathy slide. Uh, um, so in this, what we're going to do here is I'm going to talk about individual neurons. So how do they work? Well, as I told you before, neurons in the brain that are talking to each other in the cerebral cortex do so with these all or none events. They send spikes. Um, how does that work? Well, the neuron receives input from other neurons. Uh, this input can be positive or negative. 
if you get an, enough positive input uh, uh, on a short enough time scale so that it doesn't just all leak out, there's a time scale for how much you lose information in the past for a neuron, right? You have a leaky integrate and fire neurons that we're talking about. Then if you, if you reach threshold represented here with green, you'll produce one of these pink spikes. Um, and so you're seeing spikes that are occurring whenever you reach threshold. And then after a spike is produced, there's some mechanism that sends the cell back down to some resting potential. Then you get more positive and negative input. And there's a lot of fluctuating stuff going on down here, these sub-threshold fluctuations. Uh, and the model includes for each neuron this internal variable that's kind of like the voltage inside of a real neuron. It's a simplified version of that, but has that character to it. Um, and here again is our picture. You know, here's our visual scene. Here's the path we're trying to represent with a certain set of neurons. Uh, here's neuron one and neuron two. There's connections. I'm going to use Q to represent the feedforward connections from the various pixels in my patch to uh, a given neuron, and they're indexed by uh, you know which pixel we're talking about and which neuron we're talking about. And then there's um, and then there's our Ws. These are our inhibitory connection strengths between pairs of neurons. Every pair of neurons in my in the entire network is going to have an inhibitor inhibitory connection between it. Um, and there's three learning rules. There's one that says uh, how to change the threshold. And the idea is, well, we want a sparse network where not many neurons are active. OK, so what's our local learning rule that's going to achieve that? We're going to end is, our, is the count of how many spikes we got in response to the last image we showed. And p is our target value for probability of spiking. So if p is, is actually, we would typically use numbers like 1 and 20. So 0.05 is a good number for P. Actually, biologists love the number P equals 0.05, but that's a coincidence. So, uh, so 0.05 right here. And we'll see, all right, if you fire more often, if you count more spikes than that, well, that minus that's going to be a positive number. You better raise your threshold so you'll fire less, right? If you do it less than this, well, that's bad too. You don't want to be so sparse that nobody ever fires ever. So, okay, now you better lower your threshold so you have a bigger chance of actually responding to some visual stimulus. So you have a homeostatic mechanism for reaching a target level of sparseness. OK, this is independent. Every neuron gets its own little learning rule to do this. They don't need to know what the other neurons are doing to do that. Next thing is, I want decorrelation between pairs of neurons. How do I achieve that? Joel says, ah, I'm going to take the number of spikes that occurred on one neuron times the number of spikes that occurred in a second neuron, subtract my p squared target value. After all, that's what you expect by chance if they're independent of one another. Well, if they're decorrelated, right? Um, and then if, you, if this is too big, then you're going to increase your inhibitory connection and make them less correlated. If it's too small, you're going to increase, uh, sorry, decrease this value so that they are a little more correlated so that they go right to chance level where you, so you tend to fire it um, uh, uh, just as often as chance, right? Um, and there's something I was going to say about that. What was that? So these are, so uh, this is the strength of the inhibitory connection. The minus sign comes later in case that's a concern. Uh, there was something else I was going to say. Uh, oh, I guess it was that this is also a local learning rule. Yes, that's important. Why do I say that? It only depends on some internal thing, my target value, and something that is known to the synapse. Any synapse between any pair of neurons in the brain knows, if you like, whether or not the presynaptic cell, the one that's coming into the synapse, is active, and whether the postsynaptic cell is active. That's allowed in my algorithm because that's local to the synapse. That's information that any, any little synaptic connection between any pair of neurons will know. It's not going to know about these, you know, so this guy right here, W21, it's going to know all about how active neuron one's been lately and how active neuron two's been, but it's not going to know about the connection strengths over here, you know, or about this, or actually this, yeah, I can know this. Yeah, these things can know each other, but about other inhibitory connections between neuron one and neuron 55 somewhere else, it can't know that, but this learning rule only depends on the two neurons in question. So that's really good, right? Oop, oh, yeah, I got a little excited, sorry. All right, and then what's next? OHA Heb rule. So this is a Hebian, oh, I should say, this is an anti-Hebian rule. This is a Hebian rule. Who's Heb? Heb is a very important psychologist, actually a Canadian psychologist to bring up Canada again. Um, and in the 50s, he figured, he, he came up with this maxim that turned out to be really prescient. He said, look, I think, even though we don't really know much about what's going on in the brain yet, way back then, that there should be some causality involved in learning. And that if one neuron is more likely to cause another neuron to fire, then that the connection between the two should be strengthened. That was his idea, that if one neuron causes another neuron to, to be more active, that you should strengthen the connection between those two neurons. 
Uh, and it turned out that was a really good idea. And all of modern machine learning and, and neuroscience benefits from this idea. And there's lots of wrinkles on it. Um, uh, in this case, I'm showing a, an anti hebbian uh, sort of a rule that says if one guy, if two guys are, are very co-active, you tend to uh, decrease the, the, you tend to increase the inhibitory, you know, causal relationship between them, right? Um, in this case, though, we're doing the more typical thing, which is, um, so what are all these symbols here? X represents the value of my of my input, so that's the value of a pixel inside my little my little uh, image to be represented, right? That's the first time it's appeared, right? So far, there's been no image at all. It's all been about sparseness and, and independence. Now we get into representing the image. So I got my pixel value. I subtract my representation based on my single neuron. So this says how how strong is my connection right now between uh, uh, the input, that pixel, and my, uh, my, my given neuron, multiplied by how active the neuron is, n sub i. And that's my representation of the scene based on just one neuron at a time. It's a local representation. It's an impoverished representation. Nonetheless, take the difference between those things. Now multiply by uh, that, that activity again. And that's what we say we should do to change the values of the synaptic strengths from the individual pixels to any given neuron in, in our network. This is local. It only involves the activity of the neuron that's being talked to, neuron, let's say neuron two, for example, and the value of a single pixel, right? Uh, the, the pixel that we're, one of the pixels that, that, not the only one, but one of the pixels that that neuron represents. So this, if this has a name on it other than Zilberberg, the student who did the, the work in my group on this stuff, and that's because this learning rule had been thought of and used in the past, but never had this combination been considered or understood for like the, Joel's insight was that similar to a network that Foldiac came up with way back in 1990 that was similar to this, but different in detail down here, this network works in a similar way and produces a sparse representation. And Joel's network has the, Joel Zilberberg's network has a nice property that you can actually say what the objective function is that's being achieved here. That was not the case with Foldiac. Foldiac's network um, had some nice properties and it, and it produced sparse representations, and he was all about sparse coding. He's like one of the important early people thinking that sparseness was important for understanding how the brain might work, but, but the math was a little trickier, and it wasn't possible to write an objective function. So, and another thing I want to say about it, and, and just to make clear what I mean by objective function, I'll do this real quick. Um, these things right here are actually Lagrange multipliers. They're not theta, and uh, it turns out they are related to theta and w, but I wrote them this way to make the point that this is really, if you like, a constraint. And so is this. The way this network works, like, so what's the insight, right? How is it we're minimizing the RMS error across the entire image and it actually works? This is, as we said earlier, a global objective, right? How are we doing with local learning rules? Well, we're doing it by staying on a constraint surface on a, on a manifold in this huge dimensional, very high dimensional space of all the parameter values. So every parameter value is one axis in this huge high dimensional space. And what we're doing is we're maintaining sparseness um, and we're maintaining uh, decorrelation between pairs of neurons. And in that way, guaranteeing that individual neurons, the individual representing actors you know, in this population aren't stepping on each other's toes. They're not all representing the same part of the image. They're doing something different, right? By maintaining, so what do I mean by constraint surface and that it's being maintained? I mean that as Foldiac found empirically with his network back in 1990, if he, because his network was the same as far as these two terms, but different for this term. Um, actually, there was no term, there was nothing on the left side for his, it was over here, but these two things were the same for Foliac essentially, and this was a little bit different. Um, but he already noticed empirically that if he had the learning rate set really high for the first guy, for this lambda, and really high for beta, that the network worked a lot better than if he didn't have these guys set really high. In other words, if he had this, the learning rate for, uh, for this term to go the same as these guys, the network didn't work very well. Um, and, I, and that's written in words down here at the bottom. Um, and why is that? It's because of this constraint thing that Joel figured out, that this is an example of constrained optimization. And the reason it matters is that if you take the derivative with respect to Q of my lower left-hand term here, you don't exactly get the term on the lower right. You're missing one of the sums. The sum inside the, inside the parentheses should still be here, right? In other words, you should be summing over all the neurons in the network to figure out what the representation of that pixel in the image is. But we just got rid of it. Why is that okay? 
it's okay because these two terms are doing their job. They're making sure that different neurons are not active very much and they don't, and they don't get active at the same time above chance. Well, if all the neurons aren't active very much and if they don't act together more than chance, it hardly ever happens that two neurons are simultaneously representing the same part of the image just because of that constraint. And that's how you can impose through this, right, through this set of constraints up here, how we are able to learn a global objective with local learning rules. That was the basic insight. And I was over, I was over the moon with this because I said, oh, okay, finally, I get to see what a constraint optimization looks like. It's sort of obvious when somebody shows me. Everything's obvious when somebody shows me, but, um, but, but this, I think this was a really new idea um, and why it is that um, even smart people like Fo Foliak had mentioned, you know, I'd seen empirically, why is it that you get these changes in these divergences and how fast your rates ought to be? Well, here's the answer, I think. Um, and it makes a lot of predictions. So, uh, so first of all, it does as good as any other sparse coding network for predicting, um, here's macaque, uh, a rhesus monkey receptor field shapes in, in the primary visual cortex. We get the full range, we get the little point-like things, we get the Gabor-like guys that are multimodal with lots of wiggles, and then we get the long, thin uh, edge detector type things. Great, so it seems like it's getting the right features, but that's all, that, that had already been done by other models, albeit not biologically plausible ones. But then the next question is, uh, okay, so we answered is it true in real brains? Now can we can ask, well, what predictions can we ask about beyond receptive field shapes? Um, and so for the previous networks, even the really sophisticated ones, um, the way they operated was you put in by hand that you wanted the inhibitory strength between between your uh, pairs of neurons to be determined by the overlap in receptive field shape. You take a dot product between their, the features they care about and use that to put in by hand what the, um, what the inhibitory strength ought to be. But our network learns this. And it's not just a diagonal line between inhibitory connection strength and dot product between features, right? You get this spread of neurons. And sure enough, it does have the right quality. You, know, you, you have you know, a lot of points in the upper right and you got points in the lower left, but you get a lot of other stuff too. And what's nice about that is it makes predictions for connection strengths in real, in real brains. This hasn't been, this hasn't been tested uh, yet, uh, and that's because it's a hard measurement to do. Excuse me, to do. I always choke up when I look at these data. Um, but no, it's a hard, it's a hard measurement to, uh, to, to make. But, but it's one that that I can't wait to get clarity on because it will really, it'll be a good test of our model. Our model can be falsified, you know. Um, and here's some data uh, I actually took with uh, Tomas Schumacher back in my postdoc before I was uh, uh, a professor. And, and the data, actually, I, sh I shouldn't tell you this, but it was so well fed by log normal distribution that it, it, it was like if we did a chi squared, it would have been a bad, a bad fit because it was too good of a fit, uh, which is a problem you don't usually face in biology. But anyway, really good fit for log normal. What am I plotting? I'm, I'm, I'm plotting, um, uh, oh no, am I getting ahead of myself? Uh, no, no, I, I think that's correct. I'm sorry, my light is covering my axis. I think it's. I think this should be activity uh, as a function of of. Uh, oh yeah, spontaneous firing rates on the horizontal axis. I was just wasn't paying attention. Um, and I, and this is a histogram. So I'm saying how many neurons have a certain sort of basal level firing rate as you as they're responding to whatever they're responding to. And it says A1, not V1. That's not a typo. This was in the auditory cortex. So it's. So we recorded the auditory cortex in my lab. We need somebody else to look at this in the visual cortex. Um, uh, in fact, uh, this is, uh, let me make sure I know what I'm looking at. Number of cells. I'm trying to remind myself whether this is, uh, 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 th yes, this is, so this is our model on the top, right? At SailNet model. And what it's showing is a nice log normal fit for the number of cells for a given amount of firing. Um, and the same thing on the right, but where we use different contrast stimuli. It turns out it, it looks a lot, ex it looks very exponential if you present very high contrast stimuli to the network if it was trained on lower contrast stimuli. So what's been seen in V1 experimentally looks more like the exponential fit, but now we've got a prediction. If you use lower contrast stimuli, we expect a log normal fit. And to my knowledge, that still hasn't been presented in a way that, so I need to go out and hassle my visual cortex recording buddies and, and have that presented to me in a way I can make a direct comparison. Anyhow, log normal distributions of activity is what we predict. Um, we also predict log normal distribution for connection strengths across the network. Um, it turns out that if you ask, well, how strong are my inhibitory connections between pairs of neurons? It looks, uh, you know, not a perfect fit. In fact, there are some telltale departures of log normal. Maybe that's useful. In fact, if you take these seriously, hey, it looks like a good, well, okay, I want more data before I make a strong claim, but it, that it, but it, it does look like in at least one of the few places where somebody has looked, they do see a similar kind of um, 
a similar kind of distribution of um, for the for the connection strengths. However, once again, it's not exactly the right data set. This is excitatory connections, and I'm talking about inhibitory connections. It turns out to be a lot easier to measure the strength of excitatory connections because you can stimulate presynaptic neuron and then record in the postsynaptic. It's hard to measure how much you shut down the transmission that would have happened by stimulating the presynaptic neuron when it's an inhibitory sort of a connection, when it tends to depress or, or prevent the activity of the. So anyway, it's a harder measurement to do. Anyway, so yeah, I guess beautiful theories are ones that are that uh, that are hard to to, uh, to to falsify, but I like ones that are really falsifiable. So I'm looking forward to getting. Um, we've already seen some corroboration, certainly with the receptor fields and with these these almost right data sets. But I'm looking forward to actually getting the um, the, the real data. Um, so uh, this is an example. I'll just mention one slide. The thing I showed you on the last page, I'm talking about SailNet, biologically plausible local learning rules, got spiking neurons that produce these all or none events as opposed to graded output. Very realistic in that sense. It's not realistic though, in the sense that I had the same type of neuron representing excited terrain inhibitory neurons. In, in your brain, in your cerebral cortex, you have dedicated different population of neurons, two separate populations, one that's excitatory and one that's inhibitory um, with rare exceptions. But as with biology, there's always some exceptions, but, um, but the vast majority of the neurons in, in your cerebral cortex either pr uh, promote the activity of downstream neurons or, or inhibit the activity of all the downstream neurons. Um, and so we've cooked up, a, and by we, I mean uh, Paul King and again, Joel Zilberberg, cooked up a network with separate populations, and then you need more learning rules, right? Because you've got excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. You have to have um, five different learning rules instead of just three. It, without belaboring the point, you can do this, and it gives similar results. Receptive fields aren't quite as good, at least in our hands, would be fooled with so far, um, but it does work. Uh, and so, and then it makes other predictions about inhibitory versus excitatory connections. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, I'll just give a quick laundry list of sort of predictions you can make beyond um, beyond uh, just receptor field shape. One is that, um, well, first of all, yeah, accurate receptor field shapes. Okay, so the first thing we get right. Um, next thing is, uh, uh, there's a, oh yeah, we talked about that, that there's a this correlation and not just a correlation between the receptor field overlap and the inhibitory strength between the pairs of neurons, but that you get an interesting signature for what that relationship is. That's not what people, would have guessed or would you, what you get from previous models. Um, log normal distribution of firing rates, log normal distribution of synaptic strengths. Um, we also can now say that this particular population of inhibitory neurons in our, in our network uh, that are actually called FS for fast spiking that are named so because of what they do when you inject current in these neurons, they tend to spike quickly um, and they have other properties as well that distinguish them from other inhibitory neurons. Well, we can say what the computational role is for those neurons. They are there to, to um, decorrelate pairs of excitatory neurons. And the excitatory neurons are the ones that are actually representing the visual input. Um, so when, you say, when I say simple cells in V1, a neuroscientist will say, oh yeah, you're referring to all the neurons in the primary visual cortex that have certain receptive field properties. Well, some of them are in excitatory and some inhibitory. If you ask them, well, which ones are representing the input? Well, I don't know. Right? In our case, we know that the inhibitory neurons are not representing the input. They are providing the role of decorrelating pairs of excitatory neurons. And that means that they have some different properties. One is that, uh, oh yeah, they have the role of, excited, of decorrelating excitatory neurons. One is that you don't need that many inhibitory neurons because the excitatory neurons form an overcomplete representation. So you have lots of similar receptive field shapes, similar, similar features that are represented by different excitatory neurons in the network. It turns out you can just have one, you know, just one inhibitory neuron can service a group of, you know, five or so different excitatory neurons um, because they're similar enough in their in their shapes that if they all send excitatory inputs to the inhibitory neuron and then it sends back its inhibition to all the rest of them, they can dis they can inhibit say this the right way. Each of those excitatory neurons in that little subnetwork can effectively inhibit its neighbors who are coding for similar things without too much inhibiting itself through that network so that the mechanism still works. And so the network works fine if you decrease the number of inhibitory neurons until you get down to a ratio of one to four, one to five. And that's the ratio that's in our brains. Um, so I think as far as I know, it's the first theory that actually makes a claim as to why it makes a prediction actually for why it is you've got more excitatory than inhibitory neurons. And what's more, 
It also says, why should it be that inhibitory neurons fire more? Well, the inhibitory neurons are not forming a sparse representation of the input. They're there to decorrelate excitatory neurons. So the excitatory neurons have these sparse responses. The inhibitory neurons are more active, but that's okay because they're not active part of the representation. They're there in small numbers, but with an important role of decorrelating pairs of excitatory neurons. Um, so anyway, there's a laundry list of things you get from this sort of thinking, this sort of principled approach to thinking about what's going on. And also treating this, I mean, in the first place, this is a vision model. Like we're trying to understand the problem of vision. We're not just trying to model the activity or connections of neurons. Um, and there's a lot of important work that's done with, where that's the only handle they've got on what's going on. But I really like to solve a problem where, where I'm thinking about like, what is it the brain's trying to do? Um, it just makes it, I think you get, I don't know. I, anyway, it worked out for us for this model. So um, uh, yes, and sparseness can decrease during development. So I'll briefly mention that one knock against sparse coding is that there is data from ferrets actually, when you look at their neurons during development, it turns out that the neurons get more active with time, not less. And you say, well, wait a minute, if during learning they're getting more active, that sounds like sparseness is not the objective function. And indeed, if you had a, if you were doing some unconstrained optimization, maybe that's what you'd expect. But for a constrained optimization, it's easy to see. And in fact, we've cooked up examples where this is the case. If you just happen to start out where you're a little too sparse, you're gonna move up in your activity until uh, your sparseness is just right to hit your objective, where your p-value is what you set it for. Because you have a homeostatic mechanism, not just a just an unconstrained, make it as sparse as possible sort of mechanism. Um, anyway, so it turns out that we can address that concern. Um, so, so here I've given you an example of uh, biology and physics in inspired computing. Um, and uh, in fact, um, we've come up with a neural network that has nice properties and, and, it, and we're actually using it to study statistics of natural scenes and sounds. We're using it for things beyond just understanding the brain. Um, and here I've drawn a funny cartoon of, uh, of a laptop that's thinking about this. And in fact, um, I did that on purpose because, um, you know, machine, so in machine learning, in, yeah, okay, here's the opposite statement. Machine learning informs us about the brains, but it also informs us all this stuff about real artificial neural networks. In other words, if you want to really build a robot, I think I've already mentioned this a couple of times, but if you want to build a robot that actually does what any neural network does, you have to face all the same problems or many of the same problems that biology does. You need local learning rules, right? And you're probably going to use an all or none. Well, I shouldn't say that. You can use graded if you want, but, but you, there's good reason to do the things that biology does. Um, and in some cases, it's, it's unavoidable. I, I mean, I would, I'd argue that there really is no way to build a network with I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends. On, it's, a, it's a threshold. Like, it depends on how many neurons. If I say, you know, 10 to the 10 neurons, I, there, we can't build anything that big anywhere right now. So fine. But even if a far smaller network, trying to have individual synapses aware of the connection strengths of all those synapses in the network, you're just, you just can't get there from here with physical wires connecting those regions. And in fact, uh, even though our goal with this project was really to understand the brain, um, other groups have built of physical devices that use this algorithm. So there's dedicated hardware out there in cameras uh, by a couple of different engineering groups who, who, who built this thing, you know, uh, which, was, which tickled us because that wasn't our, our primary objective. Um, uh, so I think it's an important thing to understand, even if you're interested in understanding algorithms, understanding uh, artificial um, thinking machines, um, as opposed to just the brain, because it's a problem we're gonna have to face eventually if we wanna go beyond simulating deep neural networks and stuff, right? Um, okay, uh, so uh, I don't know, how are we doing for time? I think we're over. <laughs> oh, well, how about this? I'll just say quickly that, um, that, uh, that one thing that comes out of this thinking is that there's pre, there, I think I mentioned at the very beginning that there's pre-processing that everyone does ever since Bruno Olsen started doing this stuff in the, uh, the mid nineties which is you whiten your inputs. And for a visual image, this is what I mean, visual. So here's a photograph at the beach. Uh, and then here's a, here's a whitened image. And you see it's kind of a, it looks grayer, but there's a lot of emphasis on the edges between things. You, you lose the DC, the, 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 the slowly varying stuff is taken away. The point is that natural images have a power law, power spectrum. There's a lot more power in the low frequencies than the high frequencies. That's true of almost any, Anything you measure in nature, it turns out, it's, uh, they're ubiquitous in nature to see these power laws or things that are close to power laws. 
you tend to get a lot more power in low frequencies. And so first thing you do often when you process signals is you flatten the spectrum. You, and that's and it goes by a lot of names. You whiten it or you sphere it or use principal components analysis if that's the particular whitening scheme you like, whatever it is. In our network, it turns out that if you don't do that, it fails. And so I'm now beating my chest about the fact that my network can't handle things that previous networks could handle. Why is that? It's because that mechanism I told you for, for making local things work, local rules work to produce a global objective, that thing uh, does, it gets overpowered if you have too much variance in your data along some directions. Those directions dominate. Every neuron in your network learns those directions. They ignore the little stuff and you get a really bad representation of visual world. You get representations that don't have any fine detail. Whereas the usual methods that people cooked up that aren't biologically plausible, turns out that they, they don't get fooled by that. Um, uh, you don't have to pre-whiten if you want, you get the same answer either way. And this just quantifies what I just said. So our network is fragile. Um, oh yeah, and if there's a bunch of things we're doing now, I'll skip all that. I'm just gonna put up my thanks slide and just say, so, so the upshot of the last thing I was saying is just that, um, that it turns out that we have a new explanation for why your retina whitens images before it gets sent to the cerebral cortex, even though there are some really smart people in, in neuroscience and in computer science who say, well, I don't buy the sparse coding stuff because if that's such a good idea, why don't you do it in the retina? Why do you wait till you get all the way to the cortex to, to do whitening? And there's a couple of good answers to that question, but we have a new qualitative new answer to the question, which is if you wanna do it using biological plausible learning rules, you may be forced to do a, a separate pre-processing step of whitening before you can go to the stage of, of, uh, of using the sort of mechanisms we figured out, the only ones I know of for doing sparse coding um, using local rules. Anyway, the people with the, with the big names at the top in purple are the ones who actually did the work of things I showed you, Joel Zilberberg and Jason Murphy and Paul King, Nicole Carlson, Vivian Ming, Eric Dodd, Jesse Livesey, and as you hewn Bach. Um, and, uh, and then there's many other people I thank here. It, it turns into microfish at the bottom, like an eye chart, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm always loath to cut people off of my appreciation slides, but uh, thanks for our funding here in the middle. Um, and uh, yeah, if there are questions, I'll take them, or, uh, um, but uh, thanks for listening. Well, thanks, Mike. So uh, anybody that wants to, there's a, a question and answer feature on Zoom, so you're welcome to submit questions. I don't see them pouring in yet, so. I'm just going to grill Mike personally. So. People are, are dumbfounded by what they just saw. Um, but anyway, yeah, go ahead. The pace was rapid, but... Um, and yet I still went over. Yeah, it's my hallmark. I don't think whitening can be done with local rules, right? Like, because if you want to decorrelate pairwise, you got to know about pairs that are very far apart in the visual field, right? Well, so you're but a we, lot of the non But pairs, but so yeah. local, that's a great question. When I say local, I don't mean local in the visual world. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I mean local in the network. Right, so, right. so I'm allowed to decorrelate far away things in the visual field. Right, um, right. As long as there's a pair of neurons, as long as the network is configured so that the things I'm decorrelating are talking to each other, the place where they talk, that synapse they talk to each other, I'm allowed to use the activity of those two neurons if I like. Uh, uh, in principle. So but in practice is the way the, you know, sort of the retina is laid out, like, you know, is whitening plausibly local with a realistic architecture. So it turns out it's a subtle story of whitening in the retina and decorrelation in the retina. Mm -hmm. It was long thought after, so a bunch of smart people um, with beautiful data um, and, and good theories, uh, you know, back in the, gosh, back in the very early nineties, um, you know, Joe Attic and, uh, um, uh, at, uh, and, and, you know, and, and um, uh, Yang Dan, for example, and um, I'm, gosh, I'm, I'm so slow to come up with names in real time. Um, but short, my hair a, was long, yeah. Sorry? Uh, I said my thoughts were short, my hair was long. I remember those days. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, uh, no, well, I think in my case, it's a, it's a natural phenomenon. But anyway, the bottom line is that, that the, uh, there's a bunch of there was a bunch of good ideas, and I think those ideas are, are true, but they're not the whole story about how you achieve decorrelation and redundancy reduction through mm -hmm. receptive field shapes. Um, there's a nice paper by um, and from Marcus Meister's group from a few years ago, actually, I think uh, 15 years ago, I think, that actually addresses that pretty specifically in the retina, but they did a lot of careful measurements. 
And they find that there's a large role for things other than the receptive field shape having to do with dynamics and other aspects of what's going on in the retina. So, so nobody, I think nobody uh, would dispute that whitening is going on in the retina or that it's not, or that, or that it involves anything other than biologically plausible stuff. But it turns out that the range of mechanisms involved in the retina for, for doing these sort of operations is much bigger than you would have guessed based on sort of the way people were thinking about it over 10 years ago um, and, uh, or 15 years ago. Um, and, uh, and actually, it's a good question to the extent that that's been assimilated by the entire community of theorists who are thinking about uh, visual models. Um, but, but, there, but there's no issue with uh, locality. You know, like if you, if you, have, a, if you have a neuron in, in the, um, if, if you, you know, like you have neurons, you have, you know, ganglion cells, for example, uh, that actually whose axons form the, the optic nerve, right? Different ganglion cells are responsible for our hearing from or, or seeing, I should say, different sizes, you know, different receptive fields um, out of the, the, the retina, right? And some are bigger than others. And how is that possible? Well, it's because there's, there's a bunch of photoreceptors in a big array, right? And, and a, a large array might feed into, and there's a bunch of other neurons. There's the bipolar cells and there's the uh, amacrine cells. Amacrines are very, have long lateral connections to other uh, to other Americans, other, actually, is that true? I don't know. Got to think about that. Who's talking to whom exactly? Well, I'll play it safe and see something I know is true, which is American cells have lots of long distance connections. Um, and it's through those, it's through the changing, the relative importance of those long distance connections that the retina can modify the spatial correlation of the images that get sent to the, uh, uh, on, you know, to the thalamus and ultimately to the cortex. Um, and the thalamus, the sort of, Station halfway between the the retina and the uh, and the cortex, it's 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 uh, it's it's apparently performing a sort of whitening operation, but in time, it's doing temporal decorrelation, if you like. It's it's uh, it's getting rid of the temporal correlations. Uh, that's the way the story is usually presented and thought about. That you get spatial whitening going on in the in the retina, and then in the thalamus, that's responsible for temporal decorrelation. And then you get to the cortex, and then we would say, well, it looks like sparse coding gives us a good idea of what we think is happening. Um, and, and we would say, ah, and that, and that was sort of the way it had to be. You had to do some pre-whitening if you want to use local rules in the cortex. Anyway, I don't know if that addresses your question, but. Um, in many different ways. So, many different ways. Um, yeah, so natural images, right, with the power law correlations and structures, like how far down the chain do those power laws, you know, does that all get taken out at the retina with the retinal whitening, or do you find you know receptive fields that are themselves power law because you know I see mountains and I see a little mouse on my desk and well know. so so if, it's a good question if you're asking how the spatial distribution like so when you look when you look in the visual cortex in V1 right yeah well first of all look in the retina and the retina you've got different structures going on in the fovea and in the foveola way inside the fovea compared to the periphery. Right. And the spatial range, the, the range of size of things that matters changes depending on where you are in the retina. It also changes in the in primary visual cortex in V1. And so part of the way this is addressed is through a range of things that happen in a given part of the visual field, uh, which is the way I was presenting it in the talk. But part of it is because part of it is handled by look moving your eyes around, which we do constantly, right? Um, and and then just if there's a lot of high spatial frequency content somewhere in the visual scene that you think might be important, or well, there's all kinds of objective functions you might try to figure out where people tend to look where they look. Um, uh, you put your fovea there, you know, and, and by looking there, then you have access to stuff you didn't have access to when you were looking off, you know, away from that. So that complicates the story a little bit. And it would change the way I would answer the question. But if we, but if we talk about a patch that's, you know, ten degrees eccentric or whatever, I, I would be able to phrase that. But ten degrees away from the center of your vision, and ask, you know, what's the distribution of? Yeah, it's a good question. What's the distribution of, say, receptive field sizes or 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 spatial frequency? Uh, and I don't, I don't have a ready answer for you about what the distribution looks like for that. Um, but I do have a feeling that it's going to be limited. You know, you're not going to you're not going to go all the way down to the smallest scales, you know, unless you're 
in a representation that's that's you know of the fovea, right? Um, and and it turns out there's other differences between the fovea and elsewhere, which we complicate the story too. Um, but in terms of like what our our network does, um, I think to answer that question in a in a in a meaningful way, we need to look at really big patches, right? So that we can get a really big range of sizes. And you kind of got a feeling for how big our patches were. With um, it turns out we're limited by um, computer speed and size and all that, um, because you know how big a patch can we handle? Well, we go up, I think we go up, we certainly go 16 by 16 size patches, but we're not doing a thousand by a thousand, right? Um, and so I think, I think the, it's a good question though. There might be a way to answer that with pencil and paper with some good ideas um, to at least get a, a hint for it. And I don't, I don't have a quick answer for you, but I would guess that it's just gonna reflect what you see in the input. Mm -hmm. um, Except if you do a perfect job of whitening, right? Yeah, it's a good question. Once you do the whitening, so then it comes down to what the, the about the structure of natural scenes beyond the power spectrum, which is not well understood, right. even though deep learning has done a good job of extracting some pieces of information you thought would be hard to get. It's yeah. not clear exactly how it's getting that information, and it's not clear that it really reflects the full range of structure. Yeah. Um, So it's funny, right? Like this is so analogous, right, to to discussions, right? Like we were talking before we, you know, were recording about, you know, how you organize an economy of agents who have access to only to certain kinds of local knowledge, right? And we were talking about how, you know, you have a natural inhibitory thing because you have competition between firms, right? That's right. And then you're talking about this heavy learning rule, right? Of like if two things are firing at the same time, you strengthen their connection, right? You know, the, one of the things that people talk about, and I don't think there's a particularly clean answer, right, is, you know, the existence of companies, right, firm formation, right? Like, why isn't everybody just doing their job and then contracting out, you know, what they need to hire, you know, and being paid by people who need them? Why on earth do you have, you know, people in a company, right? And, you know, of course, we know it has something to do with the frictions, the fact that information processing isn't free, so I can't find people to be my customers and people to be my, you know, employers with, you know, zero cost. But it, it really does sound so similar, right, to sort of an agent based economy and why you would get firms, right? Like the, the sort of networks that are organizing to have a strong connection, right, are sort of the people who logically belong in a company, right? And particularly if you want to go with sort of all or none penalties on weights, right, then you're really like, you know, oh, these guys are in a company and these guys are not in a company. Um, and of course, then you have the X, you know, inhibitory stuff, which is this company competing with that company. I wonder, like, if you could do some really interesting things with economics as well as vision with sort of the yeah. whole, you know, well, rules are locally learnable, you know. I like, I like that setup. I, I'm sure there's something to be done there. Um, the, as we discussed before, you know, and as you just mentioned again now, there's a natural inhibition, if you like in the form of competition where there's a, you know, there's, there's some customers out there who want to buy whatever you're, is you're selling, somebody else is selling the same thing. So it comes at a cost if you and your competitor both try to solve this, sort of occupy the same niche in a, yeah. in a complex economy. And in it's this case, brand differentiation, blah, blah, that people, well, about, you know, sure. Brand differentiation and, and, and beyond that, you know, actual different delivery of services, right? It's the different or products, whatever it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, and and the the problem in the in the brain is that there isn't a natural competition. We had to impose one, right? There. So in a sense, we're solving. You know, in that way, I could, I you know, if I take a strong position, I'd say, well, we're solving a problem that is already solved in the in the in the case of of um, companies, or you know, in the in the financial or whatever the business the market, right? Um, but I don't, I mean, that's not exactly true, right? It's a different kind of competition and it's not a total, and, and in neither case is it total um, competition, right? There, there still is, you know, somebody who makes better ice cream can come in and outcompete somebody who's got, even if there's already somebody selling ice cream, right? And in fact, that's kind of true in our network too. The mechanisms we have are where, depending on how active I am, I'm gonna shut down the other guy, yeah. right? And depending on how active he is, he's going to shut me down. But if I'm a better fit to the data, 
you know, which I guess the analogy is if I'm selling something that customers want more, right, then my, I'm more active. And then I'm shutting the other guy down more than he's shutting me down. So in a sense, the network is set up just like um, it's the story we hear from about bees, right? You know, that when bees decide where they're going to make their next, uh, their next uh, um, hive, right? A bunch of foragers go out and find spots and they come back and they compete and they're honest. They, they wiggle as hard as they should based on the quality of the place they found and they shut up if somebody else is wiggling more um, because they all, you know, it turns out that the algorithm is actually good for the whole hive to do that, not just for individuals to try. And the same thing's true in our network. You know, um, it's interesting though, because, you know, in the, in the marketplace, right? Yep. In some sense, you want the whole market to succeed, but it really is, every firm for itself in terms of what the firms are trying to do you know a firm doesn't try to design its uh its its practices or which niche it's going to go for because it thinks it's good for the long-term economy probably they're saying well we're going to go out of business if we do this and we're going to make a lot of money if we do that on a, on a reasonable time scale i mean so, this is a really interesting question right like suppose you had a complete command economy you know um, would you wind up because of the constraints of local information sharing and finiteness saying that, you know, the Politburo has decreed there will be these small competing entities called companies and the most efficient way to handle the costs of transmitting information and local learning rules like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're saying the brain, you need to impose this, right? Well, yeah. you know, and you're saying it's for free in a market economy, but if you had a command economy, maybe you would actually be back to, well, now we have to impose this to get an efficient representation. Oh, the economic and, state, you know. Sure, I think an open market system. That's essentially what's happening. That there, that what the controls that exist allow and encourage independent, um, you know, competitors. Uh, right? This is the result of people's choices about how to self-organize as a society and so on and so forth. So it's possible that, yeah, like you know, it's not that different than you imposing it. You know, in, in, in fact, right? Isn't it the case that there are? So I, I saw a talk on this recently that. Um, I forget who it was, but some a CEO of a very successful company is saying, well, you know, if what you want to do is avoid being taken over by the Young Turk company that comes in and, and is disruptive and changes your business model, this is really dangerous for old companies, even really, especially the successful ones, right? They've got this business model that works. They don't have a, an effective way of dealing with, um, you know, some new company that disrupts the market. But one way to deal with it is to build a separate company within the big company and to guarantee there's no communication between that smaller company and the rest of the company. And he gave examples of, uh, I've, I've, we've already talked about ice cream, I think it was an ice cream company, or maybe it was a computer company um, as well, where examples where it worked and where it didn't work. And in fact, what made it work, and, and uh, the, at least, and, you know, maybe he cherry picked his data, because I don't know, you know more than I do about, about this sphere, but um, but the companies, these examples where it worked was where the, 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 the bigger company did something that's really rare in big companies. They said, okay, we're not going to manage this subset of the company. We're going to choose a few good people to be in charge, and we're not even going to pay attention to what they're doing. Yeah. And they're going to act like our competitor. They're going to disrupt us. Uh, mm -hmm. And if they succeed at it, okay, then we're going to, in a, in, a, in a way that benefits our company, we're going to integrate that into the rest of our, but we're not going to get taken over by or you know thrown out to pasture by some competitor and he gave examples where that actually works so so in some sense yeah there are cases where what you want to do is to um spawn in, truly disconnected uh, actors is um you know in some sense right an economy has actually a more dynamic issue right than you know it's as though that the sort of what you were going to see the statistics of visual images right, was completely changing over time, right? Because, you know, technology completely changes what the business opportunities are, right? So there isn't kind of like a right answer for the feature to recognize, as you point out, right? That can get disrupted by technology. So there's another right answer for the feature and so on. So it is like, I think it has one more time dimension, right? It's like a machine learning in a continuously evolving ensemble rather than with a static data set. Sure. But it seems to like interesting connections. So. I would I'd make a stronger statement too, which is, you know, aside from thinking of it as a time scale, it's, um, it, you know, it's possible, right? We don't know how much of our brains are, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, based on the length of the genome, we think it's really unlikely. Like genomes, like you know, what it's like a thumb drive from ten years ago, or it's got what 
two gigabytes of data. And it's not, it's not, it's, and it's redundant on top of that. And it encodes for everything in my entire body, including the parts that don't work well and including the parts that have nothing to do with my brain. Um, and so, you know, the idea that we're encoding all this is, is ridiculous, right? Clearly, we're learning from experience, we're learning from visual, as we sh I showed in this, you know, nothing's put in by hand here, except for a couple learning rules and some initial wiring, which is essentially all the all connected, like there's not much structure there. You learn it from the statistics of the inputs. Yeah. And so to what extent does our brain really work that way? There's a bunch of counterexamples that suggest that there's a lot, there's something else going on too, right? You know, a full drops and within, you know, 20 minutes it's walking around, you know, chances are it didn't learn that using these kind of algorithms, you know, deep learning as well as our algorithm takes lots, you know, millions of iterations to learn. You know, that's not realistic. If you you know, calculate back of the envelope how many images I've had to see before my brain trained up. It's way fewer than what you need for any of these networks, right? So all I'm getting at is that there's probably a lot of hard or soft or firm coding going on or whatever you want to call it. It's not all learning. And right. on top of that, saw a preprint, right? That like, I'm not going to bother to read because what would be the benefit to me? But I did read the abstract and I, as I understand it, it's one of these things where, you know, you can show, you know, some amount of brain remodeling in people who've had COVID and they're like, oh my God, it's eating your brain. And then uh, there's this counterpoint, which is actually the remodeling seems to be in the uh, olfactory cortex. So it's entirely possible that you just lost your sense of smell for three months and your brain is, you know, okay, well, we let's start adapting to this new ensemble where we're not getting, you know, smell data. And that, you know, it'll probably rewire back and you'll have, you know, but your your recovery of your sense of smell may actually be delayed as you learn to use the olfactory stuff again as it comes back physically online. But that does speak to the sort of, yeah, if the ensemble changes, maybe your brain is rewiring in real time, you know, and maybe there oh. are non-trivial ensemble changes. Well, and there are experiments where in animal models, they reroute visual and auditory information to different court parts of the cerebral cortex and it works better than you'd expect you know the rules seem to be ridiculously robust and plastic yeah uh, there yeah. are children with hemispherectomies you take out half their brain because of severe epilepsy or other problems and if you're not an expert and you see the kid playing a few years later on the playground you know you can tell something's up but the average person watching wouldn't notice right away that that kid is has half his brain or her brain missing from um, a few years ago, you know, our brains are extraordinarily robust and plastic, yeah. despite the fact that it seems like it's mostly just a few rules. Um, plus, you look at how quickly humans evolved from other creatures. I mean, it's just with random mutations and natural selection, it, that's just not possible if it's too brittle and there's too many rules imposed and too much top down control. Mm -hmm. um, I'm arguing for yeah, some aspects of market economy and evolution, I guess. But anyway, so. It's just a, it seems like learning is pretty powerful. Is there literature on, you know, like the old style CS universality classes, you know, P and NP in uh, like a machine learning context, right? Because you're sure. sort of saying, you know, like, hey, computations you can do with only local learning rules. Right. You know, maybe that's yeah, a yeah. class different from computation. Yeah, okay. That's a really good question. And I've got two answers, two classes of answers. I mean, the first is, so I gave you I gave you a one slide sort of shout out to this result we've had re more recently about how the, the retina might be important for whitening because you have to do that. Yep. Well, but how do you make a claim like that? How do you tell people? And this is our problem. This is it sits right now on the archive, this paper, but cite it, please. It's a beautiful paper, um, but it's tough to get that into a journal. Why? Um, so far, it's because it's hard to argue to people that any algorithm you think of that uses local learning rules, that whole class yeah. will have this property. And I can't honestly claim that. I don't, I don't know what that class looks like. I don't yeah. even know how to go about stating it. What I do know how to do is to say, well, any algorithm that uses the same tricks that our algorithm does, because we know how, we have an intuition for why ours works. Then yeah. I can make an argument for why this is generally gonna be true, why right, whitening right. is gonna be useful. But there is no notion of the class of local learning rule neural networks, right? And maybe there will be down the road, but right now that doesn't exist. I'd also say that there are different kinds of classes of algorithms people think about. And in our group, we've in the last year, we've been thinking a lot about um, 
there are these, so there's, it turns out if you look at deep neural networks and you consider the infinite width limit, mm -hmm. it turns out that in that case, there's a simple kernel description you can have that describes the input output relationship and the learnability in terms of a Gaussian process. So it turns out there's a really simple model you can write down that characterizes um, infinitely wide deep neural nets uh, and the way they learn and what they can learn, all kind of stuff. And we have a bunch of results that we're just about to um, submit. And we just, just submitted one and some, some others having to do with how, um, how universal this is that um, it turns out that shallow networks are just as powerful as deep neural networks. And we can even figure out what activation functions, what nonlinearities you need to impose on the shallow ones based on the, uh, and, and, um, based on the, the deep net. Um, surprising result to me. And then other things too, like uh, the fact that, um, um, the fact that if you look at really crazy networks that are nonlinear in ways that are way outside of deep neural nets. So instead of just doing matrix multiplication and pointwise nonlinearities, suppose you use really crazy nonlinearities that mix things up in a more complicated way. Turns out that if you go to this infinite width limit, that's a class of models you can actually work with and calculate stuff. And, uh, and I should say, this infinite width limit existed before, but that isn't new to us. What's new to us is using it to ask questions outside the sort of standard deep neural nets um, and start looking at stuff that's really weird, um, like, like networks that only have one layer or networks that are you know, nonlinear in ways. Um, that are, but so it turns out that you don't get that much more power, but they're just as trainable pretty much. So there, there's not a huge difference between the neural networks you read about uh, in the, you know, in all the literature and the D and, and other things you might have considered that seem like they'd be completely different. Um, I, and I'm sure our audience are dying to hear more about that. On the other hand, I am double dying to have my lunch because no doubt, no doubt. 130 here. And I held off until after your talk. So I think we're going to have to wrap up there. And All right. Enjoy your lunch, Steve. It's been great. And yeah, um, send me your preprint on the ultra wide. Thanks All right. a lot. Thanks, man. Ciao.